Welcome. These videos were recorded while I taught topics in econometrics over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, their questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. That explains why you may notice some unnatural transitions and why the videos are shorter than a normal lecture. But hopefully you will enjoy them anyway. Bye now. So, okay, let's get started now. Lecture nine, convolution theorems. This is the last lecture of the second part of this class on asymptotic approximations. And this is a class that I um, particularly enjoy. I think is is nice class and there are some really nice insights. Okay, let's move. Um, all right, so with it, local asymptotic normality, differentiability in quadratic mean, limiting distribution standard contiguous alternatives, symmetric location model, and then in between all this, we essentially had uh, Lecomte's first lemma as a main wheel to do analysis. And we cover how to do power analysis and you know local power in at least in the context of a simple model, but more importantly, the main tools and intuition behind that. And we sort of like concluded that last class when we uh, talked about local asymptotic normality, right? Today, we're gonna deviate and we're not gonna talk about testing. We're not gonna be talking about size, power, and so on. We're just gonna focus on estimation. Now let's think about estimation. And we know that when we talk about estimation, we typically you know, uh, make statements about asymptotically normal estimators and about their asymptotic variance. And we really like to use the word efficiency, right? And, and typically we'll use things as you know, asymptotic efficiency and we want estimators with minimal variance. So today we're gonna think about that. We're gonna think about, you know, what does it mean to say that an estimator is quote unquote good? And this will um, very quickly lead us to Hodge's estimator, which I know Joel talks about it, but I'm gonna go over it in more detail. And when we go over this in more detail, oh, look what I wrote here. <laughs> There's two Ps here, that shouldn't happen. Uh, we're gonna talk about super efficiency, okay? Oh, it looks like supper. But okay, let's ignore that. Um, super efficiency. And then um, once we realize that this presents some challenges to our question, uh, we're gonna see how we can answer those questions. And you know, this is a positive class. So we're gonna have answers to our questions. The answers are gonna be given by two so-called convolution theorems. And then at the end, we're gonna see the convolution theorems and you're gonna tell me like, well, how is those, how are those theorems provided an answer to our question? I'm gonna say, well, you combine that with something called Anderson's lemma, and then you're good to go. And that's sort of like the roadmap. So convolution theorems. Um, we're gonna consider a generic version of an estimation problem today, okay? Forget about testing, just gonna estimate. We're gonna have data, um, Xi, IID, with distribution P in some family ball P that is gonna be indexed by a finite dimensional parameter theta, okay? Again, this is not by any means a parametric model. We know, for example, that the symmetric location model can be written like this. And then we're gonna have an estimator. What we wish to estimate is a function of this parameter theta that I'm gonna denote by phi psi theta, which could be the identity, so it could be theta itself. Uh, but we're gonna estimate this using the data. And we're gonna assume that we have an estimator. The estimator, I'm gonna call it T, Tn. It's just gonna be a function of the sample size that we have. And we're gonna assume that square root n, Tn, psi, C, psi of theta, converges in distribution to L theta, under P theta. And this L theta is a limiting distribution, okay, um, of this um, estimator. And so one thing that I should say is today, um, I'm gonna be using the rate of convergence square root n. However, most of the stuff we're gonna say doesn't depend on that. And you can adapt to other types of estimators that converge at different rates, okay? Um, so, but you know, I remember that I always teach all this class in the board. And I remember one year, instead of using square root n, I wanted to use rn, but look how similar my rn looks to the square root n, it was a mess. Uh, students never knew if I was using square root n or rn. So it says square root n, rn, and they, what? So um, I should use a different letter. 
But today we're going to use square root n, and then we're not going to use rn. Um, question, what is the best possible limiting distribution for such an estimator, for something like this? So the question is now, you look at this L theta, and you ask yourself, uh, what's good? What would be a good limiting distribution? So what I wrote here, it is natural to measure best in terms of concentration. And we can measure concentration with the so-called loss function. So that's the approach that we are going to take now. Okay, we're gonna define something called a bowl-shaped loss function. A loss function is simply a function that I'm gonna denote with the letter L, L of X, that takes the values in zero to infinity, okay? A loss function is set to be bowl-shaped if the sub-level sets, okay, which are all the Xs such that L of X is less than or equal to some C, are convex and symmetric about the origin, okay? So usual, perhaps one of the most popular loss functions is the square one, right? So you can see that if you just set a level like C here, and then you collect all the X's um, that are below that, they're convex and they're symmetric about the origin, okay? Of course, the other one that is also quite popular is the absolute value that which looks something like this. But in principle, it could be any other loss function as long as it is uh, bowl, <coughs> sorry, uh, as long as it is bowl shape. Um, so I wrote here a common bowl shape loss function in the real line is the mean square error loss, which is the one that I did over here. Then for a given loss function, a limited distribution will be considered good if, you know, the expected value of the loss, okay, sometimes called risk, okay, or if you want the integral of the loss with respect to the limited distribution is small. And this is what we mean by concentration before. Of course, we're gonna be precise later what we mean by small, but that's conceptually the idea. And the usual example that we have in mind is that if the estimator TN that we're looking at is asymptotically normal, then this law is just gonna be a normal with mean mu theta and variance sigma theta. And then to minimize mean square error loss, it is optimal to have the mean equal to zero and the variance as small as possible, which is what we usually do. Right, which just usually look for estimators that are asymptotically and bias, and then you know just uh, try to minimize the variance. But um, while this approach is nice, and so we can say, oh look, uh, it's really easy to think about what's best. You just look for a minimum variance, okay, and try to be efficient. This approach is restricted to estimators that are asymptotically normal. And what if our question is more broadly defined. It's not that we want to restrict attention to estimations, estimators that are asymptotically normal, because in principle, there could be estimators that are not asymptotically normal, that are as good, or perhaps even better than the ones that are asymptotically normal, right? And so the question is, why would you restrict attention to asymptotically normal estimators? At the end of the class, we're gonna have answers to these questions. But for now, I want you to understand that we don't want to restrict attention to this. We want to give general statements, okay? Cool, then we're gonna illustrate everything with an example, as I said, and this is an example that is known as Hodge's estimator or super efficiency, and it's gonna go as follows. We're gonna consider a model, bold P here, that is just a normal location model with a variance equal to one. So the parameter theta is gonna be the location, the mean of the normal. This is a scalar case, so theta belongs to the real line. And we're gonna be just estimating the mean. So psi, psi of theta is just theta, okay? Um, well, if you want to do this, and if I ask any of you how you do this, you know, the modal answer will most likely be, okay, just do the sample mean, okay? That's what I would do. And there are reasons to choose that. In particular, this estimator, the sample mean, has many finite sample optimality properties. It's minimax, uh, for every bowl shape loss function is minimum variance and bias, all these things that are hold for every single n, okay? 
But, you know, we know that in the normal model or in general, in parametric models where we know the distribution of the data, we can study properties in finite samples. In general, when we go to like a model that is doesn't belong to a given family, doing such an exercise is much more involved, sometimes not even feasible, and so we rely on asymptotic approximation. So here's the deal. We're going to consider this case where we already know that the sample mean is great, okay? And we're going to try to see is that if when we do asymptotics, we also conclude that the sample mean is great, given that we know that it is great for every n, okay? So, so in other words, what I wrote here, we might reasonably expect this to be optimal asymptotically as well. So what are we going to do? We're going to bring another estimator. I'm going to call this estimator Sn. And Sn is defined here. Sn is the sample mean. Whenever the sample mean is not too small, meaning the absolute value of the sample mean is greater than n to the negative one fourth, and this estimator is zero if the sample mean is small, meaning you know the sample mean, the absolute value is less than n to the one fourth. Okay, so if you just you know this is on the real line, so now here you plot t n, and then this is zero. Here you're going to have n to the one fourth, and here you're going to have negative n to the one fourth. Sorry, negative, negative. And so if if the estimator of the sample mean falls outside this region, we're going to set s equal to t n. But if it's inside, it's just going to be zero, and that's the name of the game. Okay. So in other words. Sn is equal to Tn when Tn is far from zero, and Sn is zero when Tn is close to zero. What's immediate is that square root n Tn minus theta is distributed normal. This follows because you know the sample mean, the sample variance. Uh, so sorry, the sample mean is normal, right? So we have that square root n x bar n is exactly normal with mean theta and variance one because the data are normal. But what we don't know is what's the behavior of Sn asymptotically. And then, of course, this means that this is also asymptotically normal 0, 1, okay? So we're going to study Sn, and we'll see what we learn. All right, here's another way of writing Sn, and we're going to consider the case where theta is different than 0 first. What we're going to show is that the probability that the absolute value of Tn being greater than or equal and negative to one fourth goes to one as then it goes to infinity. And so um, to see this, just write the probability of the complement, which is the absolute value of Tn is strictly less than n to the negative one fourth. And so this is probability that Tn is in between these two numbers, as I did in the previous picture, as I we were in the previous slide. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract theta, and I'm going to multiply by square root n. So square root n and then first thing to note is that now this object that is the random element is equal to Zn, which is normal 0, 1 for every n. Uh, let me just start with theta being negative, okay? Theta being negative, okay, let's start there. So suppose that theta is negative, um, then we have that negative n to the negative 1 fourth minus theta, okay, is positive for n large enough. And so this means 
that it, oops, the square root n, negative n, negative one fourth minus theta goes to or diverges to infinity. Okay. And that is the lower bound. If you look now at theta positive, then we have that n to the negative one fourth minus theta, it's just gonna be negative for n large enough. And so square root n, negative one fourth minus theta diverges to negative infinity, right? And so we conclude here that this thing converges to zero again, since Zn is normal zero one. And in one case, you have the lower bound divergence into uh, plus infinity. And in the other case, you have the lower bound divergence to negative infinity, okay? So in this case, Sn equals to Tn with probability approaching one. And this is for the case theta is not zero. Okay. <clears throat> now let's think about the other case. Consider the case where theta is zero. So in this case, we're gonna prove that the probability the Tn greater than or equal than n negative one fourth, okay, this probability just goes to zero. So Take this probability that Tn greater than or equal than n to the negative one fourth. This is the probability that Tn is greater than or equal than n to the negative one fourth. Union Tn less than or equal than negative to the n to the negative one fourth. This is less than or equal than the probability the Tn greater than or equal than n to the negative one fourth plus probability Tn less than or equal than n to the negative one fourth. And then again, now multiply by square root n and center by theta, we have Zn here greater than or equal than square root n n to the negative one fourth minus theta, which is zero, okay? So let me simplify here, whoops. So this is n to the one fourth. And again, negative n to the one fourth. And so this probability over here goes to zero. This probability over here goes to zero and the entire expression goes to zero. So we conclude that when theta equal to zero, we have that Sn equals zero with probability approaching one. This is our simple manipulations, okay? Okay, all right, so put it together. For theta different than zero, we have that a square root n, Sn minus theta converges to a normal zero one under this distribution because you know when theta is different than zero, Sn is essentially Tn. For theta equal to zero, we have that Sn minus theta multiplied by any sequence, okay, that diverges, converges to zero. And so this is what we call superficiency, okay? This type of result. At zero, this estimator is superficient. It converts, converges super fast, okay? And so then you look at this and then you say, look, this estimator looks um, the same as the sample mean when theta is not zero, okay? But it's great when theta happens to be zero. So, you know, 
looks like this is going to be better. So, all right, if we denote by L theta, the limiting distribution of Tn, and L theta prime, the limiting distribution of Sn, it follows that for theta different than zero, the two are the same, and indeed they're equal to one because that's the variance of a normal. So if you just compute the integral for any theta that is not zero, both distributions are identical, equal to one, and that's the expected loss. But for theta equal to zero, the expected loss of the S test is just zero. And that's smaller than one, which is the loss of the maximum likelihood estimator. So Sn appears to be a better estimator of theta than Tn. And there are no mistakes in the derivations that we have done. Okay, so that's that. <coughs> However, at this point, you're experts, and then you realize that there's something fishy here, and this may not be the best way to approximate the behavior of this Sn object. And so that's why appearances can be deceiving. The idea that we did is, again, I wrote here, again, another example of poor use of asymptotics, okay? Because our hope was that this object, the square, the integral of x squared given the limiting distribution L and prime, okay, which we don't care about just per se, was a reasonable approximation to the finite sample expected loss, which is the expectation under the all theta of square root n Sn minus theta square. That's the finite sample expected loss. Of course, it depends on n, and for every n, we have a different expected loss. So what happens in finite samples? When in finite samples for thetas that are far from zero, we expect Sn to be equal to Tn. So L prime theta may be a reasonable approximation to the distribution of this guy, which says it's normal zero one. But when you're close to zero, on the other hand, Sn will frequently be different than the sample size because, you know, with some probabilities it will be zero, with some probabilities it will be something else. And so the distribution of this object is probably quite different than the normal zero one that we are using for thetas that are close to zero. There's no notion of close to zero, far from zero in what we've done. Here we just says either it's non-zero or it is zero, right? That's it. So our asymptotic approximation here says this. It's one for all thetas that are non-zero is great at zero, and it's one for all thetas that are not zero. That's the asymptotic approximation. Asymptotic approximation to what? To this risk. This lines over here is the actual finite sample risk of the Hodges estimator. So what do you see? What you see is that this estimator, when you're far from zero, and of course these are different sample sizes, the pick one are with a larger sample size, okay? So what you see is that when you're far from zero, yes, Hodges behave as maximum likelihood. It's like the sample mean and the risk look the same. When you're at zero, all these go to zero. You see that these lines are at zero. So at zero it behaves great. But the better performance at zero is traded off by worse performance at close to zero. And in this case, it could be arbitrarily worse. Right? So you buy your gains at this point by sacrificing performance close to zero, okay? Which is not captured by what we did. What we did just says at zero, you're better. At any other point, you're the same. Good, just keep using this Hodges guy. Whereas when you look at the finite sample performance, the picture is more complicated. It says, yes, you win at zero. You perform equally to the maximum likelihood when you are not close to zero, but uh, when you're close to zero, you may do you know, arbitrarily worse. So again, our notions or our use of asymptotics doesn't capture this idea. So can we do something that captures this idea? Well, if you look at this picture, and then, you, and then you look at this description that I gave over here, and then you realize 
that this estimator would be expected to perform poorly when you know you are close to zero. So what about taking some sequences of alternatives that go to zero? And that's what we're gonna do next. Before, are there any questions about what we've done so far? Okay, so let's think about a better approximation. The problem is, again, points that are close to zero, points that are different than zero, but close to zero. So we're gonna consider this sequence, theta n, h divided by n to the one fourth, and h here is between zero and one. So we're gonna consider a sequence of thetas, a th sequence of parameters that are different than zero for all n, okay? So, and then we're gonna see how this test perform along this sequence. Well, when we look at the sample mean or the maximum likelihood estimator, well, you know, you know, you can define sequences by just using double index, think about a triangular array. Now for every n, we have a different distribution, okay? But in this case, it's just so simple to get something that just depends on, on say, p0 because you recenter by the theta n and you have a normal zero one. one So as before, for the sample mean, we have something very clean. Just subtract theta n and we're going back to something very simple. So that's easy. The question is what about Sn, okay? And here I'm not gonna redo be the calculation because this is exactly what I did two slides ago. We just computed the probability that absolute value of Tn was less than n to the negative one fourth. Now we're computing this probability, okay, under sequence theta n. And so what we did before was remove the absolute value and then we got the probability of negative n to the negative one fourth Tn and n to the negative one fourth, and then we subtract the theta n and multiply by square root n, so which is what we do in the next line. So up until this line over here is exactly what we did before, except that we have theta n over here. And so since we have theta n, and theta n equals, you know, we're gonna use here that theta n is equal to h to the negative uh, n to the one fourth. So you just, plug it in, and then you have these two limits. And so, as you know, this is negative, this is positive, n grows, this goes to one. And so now this is funny because this is the event that forces S to be zero, okay? And not the event that forces S to be equal to the sample mean. And we are along a sequence of thetas that are different than zero. So, you know, when theta is different than zero, you would should expect S to be equal to the sample mean. But what this limit, um, uh, what, what's going on along this sequence of distributions is that they have values of theta that are different than zero, but they are too small, okay? And so this S statistic doesn't detect the difference between this and zero and just treat them as zero. So this probability that used to tend to zero, okay, before, now goes to one. And so if you're different than zero, but too close to zero, this S is just gonna behave as if, as if it is zero. And so now you just say, okay, what's going on then? Well, under this sequence, Sn is gonna be, sequ is gonna be zero with probability approaching one. So square root n, Sn minus theta n, which is, this is zero, this is, you know, h divided by n to the one fourth, well, this is equal to this. And so now, when you compute the, if you know by L, the limiting distribution of Tn, and L prime, the limiting distribution of Sn, okay, I'm not, um, I'm not indexing them by theta because we're just computing, these are limiting distributions along a sequence, theta n that is going to zero, okay? Then what you have is that the risk of the Hodges estimator is infinity. Because as n goes to infinity, this explodes, okay? And then the risk of the Emily is just one. And you can use other sequences, you know, for example, you could use the sequence theta n h divided by n to the half. And then if you redo everything with this sequence, you're gonna see that this risk over here, I believe is just gonna be H or negative H, okay? And so, you know, um, or negative H. 
And so um, <coughs> you can make this arbitrarily worse by just choosing a value of h that you want, okay? And you can mimic any of the pictures that we saw before. So lesson here is Sn buys its better asymptotic performance at zero at the expense of worse behavior for points close to zero. The definition of close changes with n, so this feature is not borne out by a pointwise asymptotic comparison for every theta, okay? This example is quite famous and is due to Hodges. And Sn is often referred to as a Hodges estimator. So what I want you to, I'm hoping that at least that you see this, is that this intuition over here, what's happened with Hodges, it's exactly the same as the intuition that we used when we started thinking about local power. Okay, it's just, okay, what captures power? Why, you know, pointwise approximation gives us something that we don't like. Why we let consider sequence of local alternatives. And then, you know, now here is a different purpose is identifying where this has problems and trying to use asymptotic approximations that capture this, okay? The point was asymptotic approximation gave us a picture that it was like too nice to be true. Questions? All right, hopefully this is a motivation uh, to our next slide, which is about efficiency of maximum likelihood. I'm gonna read what I wrote. I wrote background theorems that in some way show that a normal distribution with mean zero and covariance matrix equal to the inverse of the Fisher information is the best possible limiting distribution have a long history in statistics, starting with Fisher in the 20s, with contributions by Kramer, Rao, Stein, Rovin, Chernoff, and others. So the theorem, this is in quotes, uh, referred to is of course not true in general. It's just not possible to say the maximum likelihood is the best that you can do unless you start adding qualifications and things like that. And actually, hopefully, the previous example illustrates that this is difficult and shows that it is impossible to give a non-trivial definition of best to the limiting distribution, L theta, right? Because, you know, you can, it's not even enough to consider L theta and their every theta, okay? Because, you know, you can pick any value of theta, say, call it theta prime, and you can construct an estimator that is just going to be equal to maximum likelihood, but better than maximum likelihood at theta prime using the trick by Hodges, okay? And you know, that is going to introduce fine and simple issues, but as we say, asymptotically, it looked great, okay? So then, you know, it's not so easy to say that L theta is better than L theta prime and so on. So this was... Uh, a huge debate, you know, in the stats, or well, more than debate, it was intriguing. Uh, by the way, Hodges never actually published that example. Um, so, but eventually, Hayek and Lecam um, gave a complete explanation of the problem, okay? Hayek did it first, and Lecam did it better. And so, um, what these results show is that under certain conditions, the best limit distributions of estimators are in fact the limiting distributions of maximum likelihood estimators. Okay, but you know, again, as I said here, not without a number of qualifications. So in order to give these ideas precisely, you need to um, take care of some details early on. So these two theorems, one by Hayek, the other one by Lacan, that tells you that maximum likelihood is best, okay? Or estimators that have limited distributions that are asymptotically normal with the variance that is equal to the inverse of the Fisher information are known as convolution theorems. And this is what we're gonna see next. Before we do that, we need some um, additional terminology. The first one is the definition of a locally regular estimator. Definition, an estimator TN is called a sequence of locally regular estimators of psi psi theta at a point theta naught, if for every h, okay, you have that a n here is a sequence, okay, but typically a square root n, I'm just writing in generality here, t n minus the um, estimator, uh, or the function, sorry, psi at theta naught plus h divided by a n, conversion distribution to the distribution l theta naught under the sequence of local alternatives, this type of distributions or sequence that are contiguous to p theta naught, 
where the limiting distribution might depend on theta naught, as the notation explains, but not on h. The important thing is that this limiting distribution over here does not depend on h. This is the definition of regularity at a point. And if the estimator is regular at every point, you just say that it's a regular estimator. Okay? So when you hear the word regular estimators, is that estimators that for any point in the parameter space, you know, if you look at sequences of distributions like this, they just converge to a distribution that doesn't depend on H. So what this means, intuition I wrote here, a small change in the parameter should not change the distribution of the estimator too much, okay? So a disappearing small change should not change the limiting distribution at all. That's what this essentially is saying. We have the distribution of an estimator, now you move theta a little bit, you would expect that distribution not to, to move smoothly with theta. Well, then if you're just considering a limiting sequence where the parameter is getting closer and closer to theta naught, then you would expect the distribution not to be affected by that, okay? So we're gonna see that the first result that we're gonna present today about optimality and maximum likelihood uses this definition of locally regular estimators. Of course, Hodge's estimator is not regular. We saw that, okay? The limited distribution when we consider theta n dependent on h, okay? So the next piece that we need is by now your best friend, QMD, okay? We saw this the other day. Let's repeat it today. A model bold P is called differentiable in quadratic mean at theta. If there exists a measurable function, I call it eta. Let me just call it L dot right now, such that this is this holds. This is what we wrote the other day. And as we saw the other day, typically this is just the score of the model, which is the derivative of the log density, which you can write as uh, P dot divided by P. Why this is important? Because QMD is a condition that gives us local asymptotic normality. And theorems on local optimality of tests, which are the convolution theorems that we're going to present next, um, or estimators, use conditions like QMD or local asymptotic normality directly. Okay, so depending on the book, the source that you're reading, some theorems will read, okay, let's assume that the model is QMD, and in the proof they're going to be used to show that there's local asymptotic normality. Some other statements will just say, let's assume that you know the model is local asymptotically normal directly, um, and that's it. So, convolution theorems. Hayek convolution theorem shows that the limiting distribution of any regular estimator, Tn, can be written as a convolution of a normal and noise. The theorem reads as follows. Go with me. Suppose that one, ball P, is differentiable in quadratic mean at each theta with non-singular Fisher information matrix I theta. Two, the function C psi is differentiable at every theta. Three, the estimator is regular, okay, with limiting distribution L theta, okay? Then if those one, two, three happen, then we have that this distribution of the estimator L theta takes this form. That is, there exists distributions m theta such that you have a convolution. In particular, if this L has covariance matrix sigma theta, then the difference between sigma theta and this variance covariance matrix over here, which is the variance covariance matrix of a maximum likelihood estimator, is non-negative uh, definite. Okay? So the notation here, convolution, is here explained. The notation star denotes the convolution operation between two distributions should be interpreted as follows. If X has distribution F and Y has distribution G, then X plus Y has distribution F star G. So in other words, this is saying that the limited distribution is essentially the normal zero. This is really abusing notation, but just um, wanna write it down in case it just helps you know, plus noise. So this is saying, 
Now that we understand the end, let's read the beginning one more time. If the model is QMD, you're estimating a parameter that is a differentiable function of theta, and then you're using an estimator that is regular, then the limiting distribution can be written as the limiting of a normal plus noise. Not any normal, the limiting, the normal, which is the limiting distribution of a maximum likelihood estimator plus noise, okay? Which is gonna make this limiting distribution, you know, less concentrated, we'll see in a minute, than the normal one. But for now, if you think about variance, there's just gonna be the variance of this plus the variance of that. It's gonna have a larger variance. And this is the, the content of this part of the statement. So, okay, hopefully those things are clear now. One thing that we should notice without criticizing, because this is a great result, okay? Is that in a way, if you just wanna be harsh, um, you could say, well, you sort of like move the goalpost. Because what you did here is to make sure that you remove out of discussion all the things that were weird. By introducing this regular requirement, you're telling me, you know, you're not letting me play with weird estimators because, for example, now I want to come up with Hodge's case and I can't because, you know, you're just telling me that I don't belong to the club, okay? Which is, I'm not a regular estimator. And then that's why at some point Lacombe also came and said that, you know, that in a way regular estimators were like rare, meaning that it will not capture a lot of the uh, ones that you would use for counterexamples and so on. And then imposing this requirement from the get-go was too stringent, okay? It feels like, you know, when we criticize in the linear model, best linear and bias estimator, and it's like, why should we restrict to linear and unbiased um, estimators? So here you could ask yourself, why should we restrict to regular estimators? It makes sense, but you know, why? Well, here's where Lacombe essentially uh, made a spin and presented his own version of convolution theorem that reads as follows. It says, suppose that one, P is differentiable in quadratic mean at each theta with some rate a n, which I should have written that in the same way before, and non-singular efficient information matrix I of theta. Two, psi is differentiable at every theta. Three, T be any estimator such that for every theta you have convergence to some limiting distribution L theta. Then there exist distributions M theta, such that for almost every theta with respect to Levesque measure, you have the convolution that was described before. So what did Lacombe do? He removed the requirement of regular estimator. This result holds for any estimator that you can imagine, as long as it has some limiting distribution at some rate, and so then what he said is like, okay, you want to beat this maximum likelihood of limiting distribution? You can do so, but you can do so on a set of thetas that have measure zero, right? And so that's exactly what we did with Hodges. We just picked the point in that case, theta equal to zero. We made Hodges estimator better at that point. And we could have picked any other point, right? And then, you know, but... That's it. We can actually pick multiple points and improve imperial maximum likelihood. But the areas in which we were unable to make improvements are going to be areas of measure zero. Now, well, Hayek theorem is a statement about every single theta, every single DGB, but it only applies to regular estimators. Uh, Lecombe's version of the theorem applies only to, you know, a subset of thetas despite being a subset of measure one, but it applies to any estimator. And I think that if you put the two convolution theorems together, you understand the scope of the problem because either you require the estimators that you're considering to behave reasonably well, or you understand that if you want to make improvements, you're gonna only gonna be able to improve upon maximum likelihood by um, considering a, a set of uh, measure zero. Having said all this, I kept saying, improving upon maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood is best, and these two convolution theorems don't say that. They informally perhaps say that, but they're just telling you that the limiting distribution of any estimator is just gonna be the distribution of the maximum likelihood estimator plus noise, 
you know, and then we're sort of like implicitly understanding that, you know, this is worse than just not having noise because, you know, having noise doesn't sound good, but formally we haven't done it. If you want to put all the pieces together, that's what you need is Anderson Lemma, which I'm going to present next. Before I do so, are there any questions about these two convolution theorems? Okay. So I wrote here, remarkable theorem, uh, yields the assertion of Hayek's convolution theorem at almost every parameter value theta without having to impose a regularity requirement on the estimator sequence. That's uh, the almost everywhere convolution theorem. Lacan show that it is roughly true that any estimator sequence is almost Hayek regular at almost every parameter theta. And that's sort of like how he ended up proving the result is, you know, um, just by requiring that the estimator is regular almost everywhere in a way, you just can get the version of the theorem. The convolution property implies that the covariance matrix of the limiting distribution of uh, L theta, which is whatever estimator we have in mind, if it exists, must be bounded below by the inverse of the Fisher information. So this is, again, a generalization of the kramer rao lower bound in an asymptotic sense. This theorem does not contradict the results of the previous section, because in that case, we had all this normal model, C theta equal to theta, we have this is equal to one, okay? And for every theta not equal to zero, we had this. So, you know, the only part is that the theorem satisfied for M theta with distribution unit mass at zero, actually SN is the limiting distribution of the maximum likelihood for almost every theta. The one that is out is zero. You just remove zero out, done. You just get the result that you had um, before. So now, you know what we mean by best? Notice, n zero and, you know, the derivative of psi, psi, psi uh, i inverse psi uh, dot prime is the limit distribution of the MLE of psi theta in order to assert that this is in fact the best limit and distribution um, for more general loss functions, we need the following lemma. And this is known as Anderson lemma. For any bowl-shaped loss function L in RK and every probability distribution M on RK and every covariance matrix sigma, the integral of the loss with respect to a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma is less than equal than the integral of the loss with respect to the distribution that is a normal with mean zero and variance sigma convoluted with m. And so now we do have a sense of best because our convolution theorem tells us that the limiting distribution of any estimator, for example, in the case of Lacombe's result, takes this form. And then we know that, you know, the maximum likelihood estimators will take this limiting distribution. And now it doesn't matter what loss function, it doesn't have to be a square loss, it, has to be, it doesn't have to be absolute value, the result doesn't depend on the loss function as long as it is bowl shaped, okay? And then you put everything together, you know, convolution theorem tells you any estimator will have this distribution, the theorem of maximum likelihood will have this distribution, and the lemma tells you you're be better off here than here, done. You can beat that. So if best is measured by any bowl shaped loss function, then maximum likelihood estimators are best for almost every theta with respect to Lebesgue measures. The lesson is the possibility of improvement over the limit of the maximum likelihood estimators restricted to on an old set of parameters. And improvement is also possible by considering special loss functions, okay? That is something I'm not gonna discuss in this class, but there's something called James Stein's estimators, okay? The, uh, show improvement on uh, maximum likelihood estimators, but not according to these bowl shaped loss functions. An important part of convolution theorems is the assumption that the model is QMD, okay? And the other part that is important is the differentiability of the mapping psi. And so I'm gonna show an example now where QMD fails, okay? And then when QMD fails, all this falls apart. And then you already guess what's the example that I'm gonna use. But um, suppose that you say, well, you know what? Uh, differentiability of this function um, 
doesn't look like something that I would like care about. Um, I want to argue that uh, lack of differentiability of the mapping that we care about is uh, often important in economics. And then if you just look at the work of people looking at these things or these cases with non-differentiable functions, that has been done mostly by econometricians. For example, papers by Hirano and Porter, where they just study similar questions to the ones that we develop here for non-differentiable functions psi, and there's a paper in Econometrica. And then there's also papers, for example, on the validity of the bootstrap uh, by Andres Santos and co-authors, okay, uh, on in cases when you have non-differentiable functions. And then you tell me like, well, why do I care about a non-differentiable function? Well, because for example, one that typically happens, you know, suppose that theta has dimension two, is when you have the maximum between theta one and theta two. Well, that happens a lot. And that is non-differentiable, okay, when theta one is equal to theta two, which also happens a lot. When you see this, I think about auctions, okay, which is, you know, the winner, the one that has the maximum of valuations. And then you start having operators like maximums uh, often, okay? In certain partially identified models where you have bounds that are intersection bounds, so you see the maximum of this, the minimum of that, this type of things appear. And so non-differentiable functions of the parameters appear quite often in structural models in IO. All this theory falls apart. Maximum likelihood no longer necessarily best. Things that always work, like the booster or whatever, no longer work. And then you start having a completely different um, type of results. So I'm not going to discuss the non-differentiability of C here, but I do want you to keep this in mind, that all these theorems are useful because they're really be, um, thinking about smooth functionals of the parameters. And there are reasons in economics to pay attention to functions that are non-smooth. Um, what I'm going to do instead is to show you how you can really break this quite easily if you allow me to consider a model that is not QMD. And then very quickly, I can give you an estimator that is better than uh, maximum likelihood, not in a tricky way like Hodges, okay? In a real way that it just uh, dominates according to a ball function, ball shape function. So this is the example. As you know, we're gonna consider the uniform distribution. P here is going to be ball P, the family of distributions of the uniform zero theta, okay? The parameter that we care about is just theta, okay? And we know from the previous lectures that this family of distributions is nowhere differentiable in quadratic mean, okay? So what if you do maximum likelihood? Well, hopefully you know, if you don't, is in the lecture notes, uh, but you've seen at some point that the maximum likelihood estimator of theta is just the maximum of the observations, okay? And then also, um, hopefully you've done this at some point, if you just look at the distribution of n times theta minus the maximum likelihood, this converges to uh, distribution L theta, which has density one over theta exponent of negative W divided by theta. So this is an exponential distribution, okay? So non-surprisingly, if you remember the exponential distribution, okay, it looks like this, the density. So the mass of the MLE is entirely on one side, okay? Notice that I flip here. So this is not the estimator minus theta, it's theta minus the estimator. So this is always positive, okay? Because you're always running short. There's no way that the maximum of the observations are gonna be above theta by any means, right? So they're always bounded by theta all the time. So the limited distribution of this guy is just entirely on one side, which already tells you that this is just not going to work great, okay? Um, also, the rate of conversions here is n, not square root n. So, you know, you learn the support fast here. So I wrote, clearly the estimator is not asymptotically normal, although it converges at a rate n much faster than the usual square root n. The fact that the limited distribution lies completely to one side of the true parameter suggests that even better estimators may exist. So, claim. If we consider quadratic loss, and actually, okay, if we consider quadratic loss, Emily is suboptimal and dominated by this guy, 
theta tilde, which is the maximum, plus the maximum divided by n. And so the result that I'm going to show is restricted for this quadratic loss because it's simple, but the broad result doesn't depend on the loss function in the sense that give me a ball shaped loss function and I can find an estimator that is going to dominate Emily. It's not going to be the same one. It depends the, the, on the loss function, okay? But um, it's not restricted to the square loss. So let's do this. This is the estimator. So, um, let me rewrite the estimator over here. It's theta n tilde is uh, x n plus x n divided by n, or x n is the maximum of the observations. And I'm going to be using this w random variable, just w is a random variable with distribution L theta, which is a distribution that has this density, an exponential random variable. And so as a consequence, the expected value of um, w is theta. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> so now, you know, um, just look at what is n theta minus theta tilde n, which is our new estimator. And so this is um, n theta minus x minus xn divided by n. And this is n theta minus xn minus xn. And this converges in distribution to L theta minus theta, because the maximum, okay, converges to theta. This is the limited distribution of the new guy, which we're going to denote as L theta prime. So now let me look at the risk or expected loss, okay? It's just going to be the integral of x squared with respect to this distribution L prime. Well, this is the same as the integral, okay, with respect to, <clears throat> uh, let me write here, um, w minus theta squared with respect to distribution of L theta because of this relationship over here between L theta and L theta prime. And so this is the integral of W squared minus 2W theta plus W theta squared DL theta. This is the integral W squared DL theta minus 2 theta, the integral W L theta plus theta squared. And look at this. Here, this is what we said is the expected value of W, which we said is theta. So the entire thing is the integral of this, sorry, uh, sorry, minus theta square, okay, which is less than the integral w square l theta, which is the risk of MLE. This holds for any theta. Okay. So it's really easy in this case to improve upon maximum likelihood. And then you may say like, well, this, you know, where's this coming from? You pulled out this out of nowhere. Well, not really. Theta tilde n is the base estimator. of theta under square loss. Mm. 
All right. So if you change the loss function, you're going to obtain another uh, estimator, which you can do by using Bayesian you know, machinery, which we're not going to cover here. Uh, but um, then all the discussion here about admissibility, if you ever heard about what's an admissible estimator, and admissible means that you cannot dominate that estimator and so on. But in this terminology, it will mean that in this context, maximum likelihood is not admissible, okay? Because you're just going to improve upon it. And so, but more than that, I don't want to talk about that because I'm not going to cover that topic in class, is that um, this um, shows you that the minute that you remove some of the requirements of the convolution theorems, in particular, we just remove the um, differentiability in quadratic mean because the rest, you know, we satisfy, you know, psi theta here is just theta. So, of course, it's differentiable. Um, then um, you can improve upon maximum likelihood. And so the conclusion of the convolution theorem falls apart. Okay. So that's about it for today. Um, is, it was a shorter class. We spent some time talking about the problem set and the reports, but um, this um, this is also the end of the second part of the class where we talk about asymptotic approximations. The third part of the class, which starts next week, is about um, uniformity and uniform inference and inference in moment inequality models, which we're gonna get there. Any questions about today's class? Mm -hmm.